Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to Face to Face. I'm your host, Dennis Ward. Our guest this week on Face to Face is Lester House. Lester hails from Rocky Mountain Territory in Western Canada. He was involved in the American Indian Movement in the 1960s and 70s and is known for his knowledge in international law. Most recently, he's been asked to help a group who had border problems returning from the protests in Standing Rock. Lester, uh, you're, thank you for joining us here on Face to Face. For many years, you've been speaking about the need for Indigenous people to move towards tribal sovereignty because it supersedes, in your mind, the Indian Act system and domestic Canadian law. What is sovereignty in the way you define it? Well, sovereignty, if understood properly, uh, it defines a nation. And the difference here is the citizenship of a white civilized nation uh, is totally different than the citizenship of the Indian. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at the law properly, there's no way that a white civilized nation could ever make an Indian a citizen. It violates international law. It violates, uh, for that matter, uh, tribal law. Uh, and also, it really does put uh, the individual, the, uh, the Indian, in a position where they don't know who they are because that's what the result is. For non-citizenship, uh, if you look at uh, treaties to begin with, that's telling you that the Crown of England made agreements with the tribes here, acknowledging them as a tribe. And according to international law, a tribe is ruled by first law of the land. So does the Crown of England. They're the only two, the Crown Heads of Europe. All the other countries that sit at the UN level are governed by corpus juris secundum, second law of the land. So with uh, tribal citizenship, uh, we've been having a hard time, but they eventually do honor the law. So going, uh, going down across the border, we have our own passport because it explains our citizenship. So that's the, uh, that's the difference. It's hard for a lot of uh, officials within the system to accept it because for how many years have they been assuming that Indian people are citizens of Canada or the United States? Well, it's not true at all. Some of them now do know because of the recent incident at the border. So they understand citizenship somewhat. Uh, some people were going down to the protest, uh, but they had no identifications. And I knew all of them. So I got a call back home. I was in Alberta from the, uh, one of the uh, head of the border service. And he basically said, we're OK with this, but we have to have them identified. So they identified with their Indian names only. And I knew all their Indian names. So that was acceptable to him. So he had my number. Uh, he, know who, he knows who I was. I also uh, served the Obama administration in relation to citizenship, as well as the uh, government of Canada. Uh, now, having said that, we've completed our, or fulfilled our responsibility explaining citizenship. So where, when we talk about sovereignty, tribal Indian sovereignty supersedes the sovereignty of the white civilized nations those who go by second law of the land, those who sit at the UN, like Canada. I've already served uh, Canada some years ago, as well as the Queen, and she knows jurisdiction. Because it's, it's, uh, it's never been done before, other than through the late Meredith Quinn, who, who uh, passed everything to me to carry on. And that uh, in relation to citizenship, he had to arrest the judge off his bench. Supreme Court Justice in the United States. He was arrested right off his bench. Now remember, arrest doesn't mean handcuffs, jailing, and all that. In our world, arrest means, arrest comes from French, arrêt, en français. Arrêt is to stop you, but to stop you legally. So the judge stepped off his bench and left the courtroom. So those Indians who were charged were let go because citizenship, first of all, had to be uh, established in the United States courts could not establish citizenship for the Indian under their law. It's quite simple, if you understand it. 
A lot of our people don't. Lester, when we're, you know, we're discussing a bit here about Standing Rock, how would uh, this type of sovereignty impact uh, the issues they're having there with their treaty and trying to stop a pipeline on land that they believe to uh, still be theirs? Okay, there's a, there's a conflict there from within, meaning uh, you had their representatives from two different groups, some say traditionals, whatever, but there are those people who abide by the treaty. Now, uh, the other group is uh, the chief and council system, which is the elected system is an autonomy type government. And uh, actually the word comes from uh, Greek, autonomous, which means self-rule, self-law, but uh, under another supreme sovereign. So the chief and council system is under the state government. Whatever vestige of sovereignty they have left, that's where they draw them from, the state that they live in. Uh, so they're quite confined. Now, how did that turn about or come about when they have a treaty that involves international law? So it was uh, a couple of their spokesmen mentioned the 1868 Fort Lomery Treaty guaranteeing that they are Indians of their own territory. Well, that was broken down by this elective system. Once the elective system was introduced and those uh, Dakotas accepted it, then their government or chief of council system goes under the state government. So they have no jurisdiction whatsoever and what jurisdiction they do have applies only on their reserve. At one time it applied to the territory. That was long before these treaties. Now, now let's have a look at that treaty. It should guarantee them freedoms as not dictated by uh, the US of A. No, not the United States government. Those tree, those freedoms are guaranteed by the tribe living them. Now I tell people the mistake with treaties today is the understanding of it. The mistake people make is that they go by the stipulations of the treaty. Well, the stipulations are simply, you, you might even say, benefits. Talk, they talk about native rights and our education rights and everything. Well, there are no such things because the treaty made according to international law, which comes from the foundation, which is tribal law, it, it states clearly that s treaties can only be made between sovereigns. And the treaty can only be based upon peace. Now, I've said it to Supreme Court justices as well, well I'm sorry, federal court justices as well here in this country, Canada, that the uh, the assumption of jurisdiction on the part of the crown would violate that treaty and you would, sub you would subjugate yourself to arrest because they could be arrested. I could call the attorney general and have them arrested in their own jurisdiction because they're in violation of that treaty. Lester, you yourself have been involved in similar blockades and, and occupations of land. Oh, yes. When you look to the 90s and uh, Jasper National Park, do you, th do you feel these types of uh, actions are, are a good way of achieving goals? I believe they're necessary because confrontation has to take place. Uh, to what degree you do confront whatever, whatever your problem is, where uh, a lot of people now are starting to understand what violence is and what nonviolence is. When I look to uh, the South and compare notes to how we were back in the late 60s, early 70s, <coughs> we were totally unarmed, even though at times we had a rabbit gun, a 22, <coughs> or, or a gun you used for hunting. Yet, who they had coming down upon us was the Canadian Army, <laughs> the RCMP, who were very well armed. So I'm not, I'm not saying in any way that people should confront them in that manner. No, it's very dangerous. And unless you know who you are, you should not in any way attempt to resist or arm yourself at any kind of blockade. Back then, we were fortunate. We understood the laws of war, international law. And I believe that was our saving grace because the RCMP honored it and so did the Army because they know, they, they understand that. So where back in the day, it was it, the reason we, we decided, the few of us, that we would have to arm ourselves is because a lot of the protests that we attended to and were asked to come and do security for, there was always nudging, pushing, and eventually violence would break out. So we'd have to defend the people. 
So we became known as the bad guys for fighting police. Now, where uh, today, things are a lot better, but there's the example down south where you have both Indians and non-Indians confronting an issue that, sh that should be confronted all over this country. And it, to me, it's rather secularized. It's, it's more than just water. The point of it is, when they confronted them, they were, they were all peaceful, uh, but we got to look at the rule of law. But the guys in the helmets, they don't understand the, what rule of law they go by. They just obey orders. So when they say they're doing their job, they're committing a crime because those people should have, even the white people should have been protected by that treaty, which takes it to the international level of law, and they could have been stopped. Uh, I, may, I may sit here and say all that. I can back it up, but I have to go by the old way. I can't go and interfere with anybody's affairs. I have to be invited. That's the old way. Even, even the Dakotas know that, or Lakotas as they call themselves. Now, I was, uh, I was uh, burning to go down there because legally there were so many crimes committed, and I'm not talking about the crimes against the state law or federal law. I'm talking about the crimes against tribal law. Lester, I'll have to hold you there. We've got to take a quick break. We'll come back and speak more. We're speaking with Lester House. We'll be right back with Face to Face. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest today is Lester House, known for his views on sovereignty and international law. And Lester, before we went to break, we were speaking about uh, Standing Rock and the Fort Laramie Treaty down there and how you were wanting to get down there yourself because of some of the laws that you, s you felt were being broken down there. Yeah. See, the, uh, the treaty itself takes those people and renders them a protection under international law. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that they have to be a nation like the white civilized nation and sit at the UN table. No, the UN body of law, international law, is to protect those people because they have an international agreement with the United States. Now, where the Indian, thems the Indian himself or themselves violate the treaty is that they've accepted a, an autonomy type government which is under the law of the United States and under the law of the state that they reside in, North Dakota. So the elective system again is what's hampered them. If they had the uh, tribal system, which they all did prior to that treaty, where the uh, women of the clans were acknowledged as the law. So no treaty could be, could be made unless it was a particular clan woman who ratified it or said, yes, make the treaty. Now, I know that because, because of the past and some of the research I've done. Like, a, for example, in the courts here, in relation to treaty, which could have happened down in the United States at Standing Rock, in the courts here, I've represented people who were supposed to be protected by that treaty. Now, in uh, two of the cases that I recall, the judge knew immediately what I was talking about but he insisted on assuming jurisdiction. So I had to tell him, should he continue the assumption of jurisdiction, he could be arrested. So in other words, why can I do that? Why can I have him arrested? Because he's subject to his law, and he's also subject to mine, because I go by a law that supersedes the law of Canada. Now, treaty, it's based upon treaties. And the treaties I speak of are before Columbus. There are six treaties that are the foundation of international law that every nation must abide by. I came onto these treaties through the late Meredith Quinn, who's registered at the United Nations as a Dakota uh, signatory Indian. And uh, he's the one that arrested two Supreme Court justices by using the law. Now, the reason they submitted immediately and stepped off the bench is so that they wouldn't be responsible for the collapse of their corpus juris secundum, the collapse of their rule of law. Because their rule of law is second law of the land, corpus juris secundum. The late Meredith went by, as I do now, first law of the land, supersedes 
What are uh, judges' reactions, Lester, when they see you walk into uh, the courtroom? Well, I'll say this. They, uh, they always usually ask ahead of time, who's your legal representative? It's a lot of the people that call me. And when they find out, uh, there's, usually, there's usually a shuffle. Because I've been through uh, four judges who would not, who finally, all of them, four of them, stepped down. They didn't want to, they didn't want to handle it. So it ended up back with the original judge. So I'm well known among the judiciary, and I'm not very well liked. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel good about that. Uh, we mentioned that you know that you're involved with uh, a case where uh, some people from here, Treaty One, Manitoba, uh, went down to Standing Rock to uh, protest the pipeline there. Had trouble coming back up through the border. Uh, there was recently a court date on that. Can you update us uh, on where things are at with those legal proceedings? Yeah, uh, just recently, or this past week. Uh, we appeared here in uh, Winnipeg court. Uh, there were, they had just a magistrate where there was no judge, so there was no, uh, there was no case. It will go on the 27th of this month. I'm sorry, of April, I'm sorry. Now, uh, what was said was that after I made the legal presentation, uh, the prosecution accepted it. And I, I encouraged him to take some time to review it because it's, it involves a lot of law. So he agreed, and he'll be on the case. But they, they needed a judge. There was no judge available for that time, just a magistrate. So she declined to be served the, the document. So it will go on to another judge on the 27th. Now, the situation with them is exactly what we talked about uh, in relation to Standing Rock, the treaty. Up here, you have them protected by a treaty, either that or there is an assumption of jurisdiction or somebody uh, did something to alter that treaty. Now again, I'm not talking about the agreement, the re written stipulations of that treaty, because that was written by Great Britain or its re representatives, and not by the Indian. Now, uh, we're not talking about ignorance here, because in this part of the world, Indians were making treaties long before Columbus. Now, uh, to give you a, a little background, so where they have an agreement with the Crown of England, there is no agreement with a country called Canada because the treaties were made with the Crown of England. Now, the Crown of England passed on that responsibility. Well, when I go into a court of law, I point out that what transpired in actuality was a crime. You cannot pass the responsibility of a sovereign onto a corporate type government, which Canada is. Canada is not a sovereignty. So I study the structure of Canada, and according to uh, international law, Canada is actually like third world. They are, they are a de facto type government, a corporate government. So where treaties are, are now under Canada, that's because the National Indian Organizations, at one time it was the National Indian Brotherhood, now it's the Na NIB. Uh, remember in 1982, what did they do? 1982, the Constitution came home here to Canada. Now, it was ratified and all that. Now, the Constitution is supposed to protect particular rights of Canadians. So what happened? The chiefs of the AFN, they went up, or I think it was still National Indian Brotherhood then, they went up to the government of Canada and they said, we want our rights guaranteed under your Constitution. Well, the government loved that. We'll do it for you, no problem. So they are now under the government of Canada where that treaty could have been used at the international level to free their people. Free meaning off the reservation. Because according to international law, reservations, reserves, pueblos, rancheros, Indian country are terms identifying a prisoner of war camp. International law. Ask any advisors, they'll tell you the same. So when I come across these things, how do you rectify that? How do you use the law of that treaty to free the people? Well, here's what it is. When I present the rule of law, not the stipulations of the treaty, that's got nothing to do with it. The rule of law says you made an agreement, your country made an agreement with this man's forefathers or this woman's forefathers who are, in actuality, sovereigns in the truest sense of the term. Now, for you to attack a corporate government with its 
uh, law courts attacking and bringing Indian people who are actually to be protected. A crime has been committed when that happens. So I'm not there to address the crime because I can call their jurisdiction to have it addressed. But when it's pointed out to judges, they realize this is not a dumb hillbilly Indian here, although I am a hillbilly Indian. <laughs> so I want people to learn, those who are protected by a treaty, how that protection is rendered to you. And a lot of people are starting to understand it now. And I believe uh, the present government, uh, the young fellow Trudeau, see, it was his dad we were up against back in 69, you know. <laughs> and he was determined to terminate Indian status. So we'd all be make-believe citizens of Canada. Well, he thought that, he really thought that the Indian people were that ignorant that they would allow termination to take place. There was, there was a lot of resistance. I remember being part of it. So that's the example. Now, his son and others have tried it. Uh, now, how they do it is quite subtle. They implement programs that they're trying to introduce uh, in 1969 through the, many are calling the white paper policy. Now it's called the Buffalo Jump. Uh, so these programs are now given to the AFN and other organizations across the country to implement. They're worded differently, but they have the same purpose, and that's to break down the last vestiges of Indian sovereignty. Lester, I feel we, we could have done two shows with you here. I was hoping we could have got around to uh, hunting, uh, something you've also had issues, oh, with. Have <laughs> had issues with. Maybe we'll have to have you back, but uh, that's all the time we have for today's show. We'll be back to uh, show you a piece of next, a promo of next week's show coming up on Face to Face after this quick break. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our thanks again to Lester House. Next week on the show, we'll be discussing the ongoing fentanyl crisis. Our guest will be Dr. Jim Sim, an opioid expert who feels fentanyl is just the latest blip on an opioid problem that's been around for 17 years. Here's a quick look at some of our conversation. Can you describe to us, you know, what day-to-day -day living conditions for somebody with this uh, addiction is like? For a lot of my patients, it, it becomes overwhelming. It takes over their entire life. Uh, people aren't able to work anymore. They're not able to take care of their children. Their whole day revolves around trying to get the substance or recovering or from the use of the substance. Uh, I tell residents that often there's only three ways people can uh, sustain this habit, and that's to steal, peel, or deal, which basically means they have to indulge in crime, they have to engage in prostitution, uh, or they have to deal themselves to support their habits. That's all for today. We're always looking for new guests. So if you have any suggestions, please email us at news at aptn.ca. Thank you for tuning in to Face to Face. I'm Dennis Ward. We'll see you next time.